And in fact, we'll be looking at the very fact that we can be thankful to come to the table. Found in John chapter 12. We're going to look at the, this message about title, Thankful for the Passover. The Passover is a very somber occasion. In fact, if you were to ask someone who was born Jewish, then uh, when they have the Passover meal, it's a very somber occasion for them. In fact, if you were to ask our brothers and sisters who are Messianic Jews, these are those who were born with Jewish heritage, but uh, now see Jesus as the Messiah, and they recognize Him as their, their Savior, and still celebrate and recognize their Jewish holiday and ancestry, they say Passover is a very somber occasion. And many Christians feel the same way and view the Passover as a somber occasion. But today, I want us to look at it with a whole other lens, I guess if you will, the very fact that we can be thankful and celebrate the Passover. It's found in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning as we read God's Word. It says here in John 12, 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Now they're coming to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. 21 says, Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Lord God, we ask you bless the reading of the scripture here this morning. And as we examine through it, God, we pray that you fill each heart with your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin here this morning, we first look at the feast to celebrate. And that is the Passover. We begin there in verse 20 where they have now come to Jerusalem to celebrate or to, to, to partake of this feast that, that they do annually to remember the Passover that took place in Jewish life. Uh, in fact, if we go back to Exodus chapter 12, we see the very first Passover. Uh, in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herb they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boil it with, at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head, its legs, its entrails. You sh shall not let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it till, until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And so here, God is telling them, if you remember the story there in Exodus, that the Spirit of God is about to move through Egypt. And where any household that does not have the blood of the Lamb sprinkled on the doorpost, uh, on the door frame around the house, any house that does not have that, then the Spirit of God would come in and kill the firstborn male of all those in, in Egypt. But the, the Jews, the ghost God had chosen, they were to take this lamb and to sprinkle the blood upon the door so that the Spirit of God would pass over and not kill the firstborn male there in that household. So there's a few things to think about as we, as we look at the Passover bill and study this here today. First thing is the, the lamb was picked. It was chosen. It was selected. In fact, they selected it on the 10th day 
but it, it wouldn't be slain until the, the 14th day. And so 1 Peter tells us in chapter 1, verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So just like the Lamb that was chosen, that was selected, and examined, and, and, and picked, Jesus Christ was also selected. Not just at the day of the cross. Not just the day in the manger. But even before creation. So, well over 4,000 years before Jesus would come, God had already ordained that to take place. He was picked. He was chosen. He was and selected to be the Savior of the world. Secondly, and, and folks, I know some of you really like to follow along with the, the one of the blank notes. If for no other reason it tells you when we're about to be done, you can leave. I had to make some changes to my notes this morning because God has really spoke to me. So some of your blanks, you're going to add in. You're going to add more blanks. Just follow along the screen if you can even read that. I know it's kind of dark. But if you can follow along, uh, uh -oh. if, you can, if you can't come see me afterwards, and I'll get you my notes. The second thing is that the lamb was personal. The family would take this lamb into their household and treat it as a pet. For these four days, from day 10 to day 14, they would love on this animal. Uh, it was now there, and just like any of you who might take in a stray, or maybe a, a, a pet was, was left at your doorstep or something, and if you were to take this animal in, you, your spouse, your children, everybody would begin to fall in love with this animal. And so this became a personal uh, animal to them. It wasn't just something, some random lamb that went out to the pasture and just pulled in, it was picked and it was personal. Third, the lamb was precious. We see this take place in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. One verse we earlier than what we just read. But this lamb was not just some ordinary lamb. It was one that was precious and valuable to them. And that's exactly what God said about his lamb. In 1 Peter 1 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed, was so precious. He did what no other person could do, and that is shed his blood for the remission of sin. You and I might bleed, our blood has no power. The power of Jesus' blood is precious, it has the power to. Remove our sins. Fourth, the lamb was perfect. The lamb was perfect. So for these four days that they would bring this lamb into their household, they would examine it. Yes, they're getting to know it. They're falling in love with it. But they're saying that there is no blemish, no spot. Nothing wrong with this lamb at all. It is perfect in every way. And so that they would then be able to make a sacrifice unto God that was perfect. They weren't giving God their second best or third best or some run-of-the-mill lamb. It was the best of the best. It was the best they had to offer Him. It was perfect. Jesus Christ was tested and was proved to be perfect. Sinless. He made no mistakes. And while He was tempted, just as we are tempted, He did not sin. He was the perfect Lamb of God. Next, the Lamb is to be preserved. That just means that He's to be remembered. It, it is something that we should think about. And not just once a year, not just on special holidays, but every day of your life, you want to remember what Jesus did for you. The very fact that He shed His blood so that you can be made right with God, to take away your sins, so that you no longer uh, get what you deserve, you can now have the mercy and grace of God. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, we read, So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So here, they are to celebrate every year the Passover. We need to remember what Jesus did for us. It is to be preserved. But then, the 
final aspect of this lamb, and I know it's not in your notes, you need to add this to it, is that the lamb needs to be passed on. Yes, you need to remember it. You need to preserve it in your memory. Our lamb was definitely perfect. It was precious. It was personal. And it was hand selected or picked. But folks, if we keep it to ourselves, then we are not doing any good to this world. We need to pass on the fact that Jesus died for our sins. That he has good news. That he will wash away each and every sin if we just receive him. We need to pass that on. We have some good news to share. So let's do so. So while we see that there is a feast to celebrate, that's the Passover, I want you to also see that as Jesus was talking there, he's basically telling them that the future had now come. The future is now here. And he's talking about the crucifixion. In verse 23, Jesus said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You see, Jesus knew his future. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that just in a matter of time, he was going to be betrayed by one of his very own. He also knew that one of his very own would deny him three times. He also knew that he was about to be tortured for crimes that he did not commit. He knew that he was going to die on a cross. And he also knew that since, even since before creation, not just on the day one of creation, but before creation, Every single moment was pointing to this very time that was about to take place. And that moment is now here. And so Jesus is feeling the gravity of all this, that all of eternity is focused on this one specific moment in time when Jesus was going to go to the cross. But praise God, that's not the story in it. Jesus also was looking forward and looking a few days ahead and focusing on the very fact that he would be raised from the dead and would be alive forevermore. See, Jesus didn't have a somber attitude. Yeah, he knew it was about to take place. And he knew that it was going to be difficult even for the Son of God. But he saw the final chapter. He knew it was going to take place. Even after the death of the cross. Even after the burial and being sealed up in the tomb. He knew that he was going to walk out of the grave. Because death has no hold on him. The grave could not keep him down. He had victory. And in Christ you too can have victory. Because not only does Jesus know his future. He knows your future too. He knows everything about you. He knows where you've been. And what you've done. He knows your crimes. He knows how, how, how despicable you might be. And how despicable I am. He knows who you are, where you've been, what you've done. He also knows what you're going through right now. Some of you might be sitting here and your world is, is crashing in around you. You are in an upheaval. Because nothing is going wrong. Nothing is going the way you planned. You're lonely, depressed, cold both outside and on the inside. Jesus knows that. It reminds me of the song that the McGraves made famous. He knows my name. The chorus goes like this. And, and he knows my name. Every step that I take Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain and I can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine because He knows my name. Yes, He knows where you've been and what you've done. And He knows what you're going through right now because He knows you personally, intimately. He also knows where you're going. He knows what the future holds for each and every one of us. The thing is, is, He wants to be the one leading our future. He wants to be the one directing our path. Not just allowing us to wander aimlessly. He wants to be in control. 
Are you letting him be in control of your life? Are you letting him lead your path? Because if you're not walking with him, then you are not going in the direction that he wants you to go. And not only does he not want you to go there, but folks, when you get there, you won't want to be there either. It is vitally important that we surrender our lives to him so that he is in total control of our lives and he is guiding or directing our paths. Because his future is perfect. All we know how to do is mess things up. Let's let him be in control. So while he knows his future, he knows our future too, it's all because he has the ability to, to look ahead. To, to look at to, to what is coming ahead. He knew that in his path there was the cross. He knew that there was the grave still to come. He also knew that the resurrection was going to prove that he is the Son of God. The folks, there's one more chapter to that story. It's not just the death on the cross to take away our sins. It's not just the grave that proved that he was dead and not just asleep or unconscious. He was, he was dead and buried in the grave. And then three days later, he arose from the grave to conquer death. But folks, one day, he's coming back. The return of Jesus is imminent. And as they didn't ask that question, it could be today. Are you ready? If he were to say, I'm not going to send you through one more holiday season. You're not going to go out and buy one more gift. You're not going to prepare one more turkey. He's coming back to the Are you ready? Are you prepared to met him today? Well, folks, there is one powerful statement in place that we read. That's what we want to look at in closing today. And that is the Greeks who came. The, the Greeks who came to Jerusalem to, to celebrate the Passover. You know, who are the Greeks? They, they were basically anybody that was not Jewish. Oftentimes we call them the, the Gentiles. But they were not Jewish by birth. They were not Jewish. Uh, uh, most of the time they weren't Jewish even by their, their practices. Now these right here probably converted to Judaism. So they were practicing Jews, they just weren't blood Jews. And so they had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And so these Greeks, these Gentiles, that were not born Jewish, would represent you and me. You and me, we have the opportunity to come to Jesus. And it says there that in verse 20, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. See, Jesus came not just for the bloodline of the Jews. He also came for those who were Greeks, Gentiles, you and me. And he came not only for the elite or for the perfect, for the religious, the pious, the holier than thou. No, he also came for the imperfect, those who were hurting, like maybe today. Maybe you're here today, you're, you're the one who's hurting. He came for you. He came for the sinner. He came for you. Whatever your name is, wherever you're from, whatever you've done, whatever you're going through right now, He came for you. Why? Because He loves you. He loves you so much. So while he came for us. We must come to Him. We've we got to come to Him and, and trust in Him as Savior. Make Him Lord of our lives. In verse 26 we read, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there the servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. That's talking about a relationship. You get to have a relationship with God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he loves you, he desires to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. 
and usher you into the presence of God, the Creator, the Judge, the Ruler, the one who's in control of all this. Jesus wants to bring you to Him and say, Father, this is my prized possession, and I'm giving them to you. That's what Jesus wants to do. That's what this is talking about right here. So when Jesus, when you surrender your life to Him and make Him Lord of your life, you now want to serve Him and obey Him and follow Him. You want to love Him and give Him all that you've got. Can I tell you what I'm thankful for this Thanksgiving season? I am thankful for these Gentiles right here. These Gentiles who came to Jerusalem to celebrate a Passover meal. But they came not merely to have a meal. They want to see Jesus. Praise God for these Gentiles. You and I can follow their example. Why are you here today? Are you here today because you're celebrating Thanksgiving with family? And you, uh, you're, you're at their house and they invite you and you're about to have a, a Thanksgiving meal or lunch. And you're here for a meal. Or maybe you're here because it's where you've always been. Maybe you're here for some other reason. But if there's any reason other than the fact that you want to see Jesus, then it's the wrong reason. Folks, as we gather here today, worship Him, we want to see Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to partake of uh, these elements of the Lord's Supper that represent what Jesus did for us on the cross to take away our sins. And just like I shared with our children just a moment ago during our kids' devotion, it is a very sacred time. And it's not to be treated flippantly. We don't partake of it like we would a, a turkey dressing meal and just pig out. We examine our own hearts. First thing I want you to do is examine your own heart. Are you right with God? Have you cried out to Him and asked Him to become the Lord of your life? If you've never invited Him to become the Lord of your life, then this Lord's Supper is not for you. But it can be. In just a moment, I'm going to stand down front. Brother Cody's going to be here with me. You can make your way down the aisle during our hymn of invitation and say, I need to be saved. I need Jesus to be Lord of my life. Then you can now have a relationship with God through Jesus. And then you can rightly partake the Lord's Supper. But even then, if you're here today, you're not living right with God. You're letting your sins run rampant. You have unconfessed sin. And you need to examine your own heart as well and get right with Him before we do so. This invitation is for preaching. This invitation is for all of us. If there's anything in your life that you need to give to Him, then this time is for you. So before we can partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to have a time to respond to God's message. So today, as God has spoken to you, if there's something that you need to get right with Him, maybe it's for salvation, maybe it's for confession, maybe it's to become a part of this local body of believers to join this church. Maybe it's to get your, your baptism right, be baptized, to get baptism on the right side of your salvation. Maybe it's something else entirely. <coughs> if God is speaking to you right this moment, you're hearing the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, then don't ignore it. <coughs> don't tell Him no. If you listen and you obey. Our Heavenly Father, today as we have Open your word and sing your message to us. We've heard your message speak to our hearts. God, I pray that we are at this very moment examining ourselves. God, if there's anyone in here that's never trusted in you as Lord and Savior, that this invitation will, will be their opportunity to invite you in. But God, I pray that as we have our invitation, and then as we conclude with the Lord's Supper, God, I pray that we just fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and protector of our faith, the one who came and died for our sins so that we can be made right with you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you. We want to celebrate you here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand for you here this morning. Brother Cody and I are down here.